Today marks the end of 11 long and stressful months for these families. Their soldiers are finally coming home from Iraq. They've been expecting them ever since major combat was declared over in May, but the ongoing occupation of Iraq delayed their return. St. Louis Blues, Glenn Miller, there we go. It's not just families who are waiting. The local Vietnam veterans will be here to welcome home every plane. We'll be here 6 o'clock Sunday morning, and we're going to be here 8.30 that night, and we'll be here Monday morning at 6 o'clock, and then we'll be here Tuesday, Wednesday, and we'll be here Thursday morning at 01.30 in the morning. These soldiers are from the 3rd Infantry Division. They're local and national heroes. Known as the 3rd ID, they were amongst the first to cross over into Iraq and led the victorious march into Baghdad. 44 soldiers from this division were killed in Iraq. While today is a special day, here at Fort Stewart in the state of Georgia, love of country and love of the military runs strong every day. This is the heartland of American patriotism. More than 16,000 people from this town were sent to fight in Iraq. According to the editor of the local paper, it was a war the whole town was right behind. But as, as far as whether or not the, the war needed to happen and whether or not that this was justified, there wasn't a whole lot of debate about it. Just not very much at all. Every, every, it was, uh, I don't want to say it's unanimous, but it was, uh, it was an overwhelming majority of folks who figured, let's, let's get this done and let's get it done right this time. But dissent did emerge here. When the return home date of the troops kept getting pushed back time and time again, a large group of soldiers' wives banded together and did the unthinkable. They publicly spoke out about the campaign in Iraq and demanded the troops, their husbands, be brought home. In July, they took their story to the local TV station. Granted, they are defending America, you know, um, that they can just send them over there and fight and fight and fight, and, and they're human. You know, they, they feel, they're, they're emotionally drained. And so are they. While many endure the hardships of being a single parent, many of them are enduring the horror stories they are being told. He actually told me he has nothing else to give. He just really wants to come home with his family because the treatment and the things that he's had to endure over there is ridiculous. Our morale is not high or even low. Our morale is non-existent. Such dissent from within the military community, particularly during the course of a war, was unprecedented. The wives held meetings, wrote letters and spoke to local and national media. It was a shock to the town. So this level of, of outspokenness was, was, was pretty new, especially around here. Thank you. Kimberly Hernandez was one of the wives who spoke out. Her husband, Carlos, is a sergeant in the 3rd Infantry Division. Was it in Baghdad or in Fallujah where it was the day you were supposed to pack to come home that they told you you weren't? Baghdad. The very day that they were packing to come home, they said, you're going to stay. Sent them to Fallujah. Schaefer, he got shot. He's my soldier that got shot. 
Carlos Hernandez has just returned home after nearly 11 months in Iraq and Kuwait. Kimberly was just one of hundreds of women at Fort Stewart agitating for her husband's return. The whole post, you know, was very gung-ho and very involved and very ready to do anything they needed to do to get their soldier home. From mommy and daddy. The top military brass reacted. A general from another base was sent to talk to the wives. It was reported that at one closed-door meeting with 800 furious wives, a colonel had to be escorted from the room. The biggest reprimand, though, came from the wife of the division's commanding general. Anita Blunt is one of the most influential women on base. She wrote a letter to the local military paper saying the wives' campaign could encourage more guerrilla attacks against US troops. When the Iraqis see media coverage of disgruntled Americans publicly campaigning for the return of our soldiers from Iraq, they're encouraged and believe their strategy is working. Kimberly Hernandez started getting phone calls. A lot of the calls that I was getting from people who were perceiving it in a negative way felt that if we were over here saying, you know, we want our soldiers to come home, that the people in the Middle East would think that we're trying to get them all home, that we don't want them there, and they might try harder to target them to make them all leave as before in the first Gulf War when they left. So who, who was saying this kind of thing? Different people when I would get phone calls, you know, this is how it's being perceived, this is how you want to be perceived. So, I mean, so who, what kind of people were calling you? Um, I really wouldn't want to give names or anything like that, but it was but you were receiving impressionable. <laughs> yeah. That's oh, we have eggs. Stop, don't Kimberly took this on board and cancelled a rally she'd been planning. She was also worried she was being seen as anti-war, which she's not. When news of the wives' campaign reached the troops in Iraq, they were surprised but supportive. Oh, we was happy. <laughs> because uh, speaking out is something that we can't do. No, there, there's no excuse for it. That we cannot, I mean, express our feelings in the military. It's, you, you just can't. And most of the time when we did talk to the wives, they, you couldn't help it, but your feelings were expressed, you know, on the situation. So basically, the wives spoke out for the soldiers. For at least some of the troops, this was a time of low morale. It was when the expectation of a short, sharp victory as welcomed liberators gave way to the reality of an ongoing, dangerous occupation. And the thought of, okay, I made it through the most heaviest battle and now they're gonna make me stay longer. And I thought I was, I made it through the war and I might get killed, you know, from some little, something, not, not war, just a terrorist attack and not make it home. Ready, ready, go home, sir. Ready, go home. Ready, go home, sir. Morale may have been bad, but no one was prepared for the news America woke up to one morning in July. A group of Third ID soldiers effectively broke ranks on prime time television and attacked those responsible for the war. If Donald Rumsfeld were sitting here at this table with us, what would you say to him? I don't know if I can really say that on camera. <laughs> <laughs> I'd ask him why we're still here. So I, don't, I don't have any clue as to why we're still in Iraq. If Donald Rumsfeld was here, I'd ask him for his resignation. What was the reaction? amongst the other soldiers when you saw that they had actually given these interviews? Uh, we was all... Wow. Wow. <laughs> yeah. Wow in a positive or a negative? No, in a positive, in a sense. Kind of unbelievable, yeah. don't you think? Mm -hmm. It's like, woo. Back at Fort Stewart, the locals were horrified. For Butch Hemingway, who's lived in the town ever since his tour of Vietnam, it was simply unforgivable. I don't think they should have done it. That's a personal opinion. I think they broke that code. Uh, my personal opinion is they ruined their careers. But who knows? We'll see when they get back. Tell me, what's this code? Tell me about the code. 
you should never speak out against your leaders if you disagree with what they're doing. I mean, you just, you just don't do that. You're going to ruin your career if you do. I got him. <laughs> The tension in Fort Stewart has only been resolved by the return home of the soldiers. It had better be about a year or so before this community is asked to go back over there. I mean, it's, 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 it's been pretty much put through the ringer since, since March. So, you know, if, if, the, if the Pentagon decides that, you know, we need to send a 3rd Infantry back over, it better, it better wait. It better wait a good year and a half to, to, uh, to make that happen. Here at Fort Bragg in North Carolina, the troops that are replacing the 3rd ID in Iraq are training. Go up the street, go up the street. Sharu, Sharu. Sharu. All right. Sharu, Sharu. What do we got? Row flare, row flare. All right, index, bring it out. Okay, where'd you come off at? Okay, right into here. Okay, where'd you stop? Right at this point, right where I'm standing. Okay, all right. These soldiers are from the 82nd Airborne Division. They're leaving for Iraq in less than a week. Go ahead and put your weapon up like you had. Okay. See what I'm saying? Correct, sir. Don't, don't flag your muzzle. What you want to do? Today they're touching up on their urban warfare skills. Go ahead and pie around the corner. Just take a step. There you go. Boom, okay. We do things the textbook way initially to show you exactly how it's done, but this is not textbook, okay? A rock is not going to be textbook. You can't Sergeant say, White and around uh, half his squad have only there. recently returned from the they war in Afghanistan. Others, like Private Massif, are just out of high school. Said, well, like the They're preparing to enter what's now being called an insurgent guerrilla war. Each room is its own little battleground, all right? Collapse your sector, put your security, Everything will be fucking fine, all right? You screw around, stop paying attention, but lose your situational awareness, you're going to get shot, okay? Or worse than that, you'll live when your buddies are going to get shot. Fort Bragg is one of the biggest military bases in America and has played a key role in George Bush's war on terror. That one's off to Iraq, is it? Yeah. Any of the C-17s like that that are leaving here are going to Iraq. Like Fort Stewart, Fort Bragg and the surrounding town is steeped in military history and culture. It's been a major military town since before the Second World War. But just a few miles from where the troops are training, voices are being raised against the deployment, again from within the military. It's a Wednesday afternoon in downtown Fayetteville, the home of Fort Bragg. The local peace group is holding their weekly anti-war vigil. More, more years. More years. Bring them home. Lorraine Butner used to be in the military. She says the small numbers at the vigil do not reflect a lack of support. Do you think that there, there are many military families who feel the same way in this town? Yes, there are. There are very many others. But a lot of people are afraid to come out and say anything. I and mean, it can hurt them. It can hurt their career. It can, uh, what the wife does can hurt the husband's career or vice versa. Um, what they do and what they say has its effect. There's a strong belief in military circles that the behaviour of a spouse can directly affect a soldier's career. Conventional military wisdom says this woman is taking a risk even standing here. I read all the what's on your website because I was looking for different things, different um, activities that were going on. Nevertheless, there are some wives of serving members of the military who are willing to speak publicly. I was looking, I wanted to, she can sit right here. <laughs> Pam Nolan's husband is a soldier currently deployed in Iraq. At the last election, Pam was a vocal supporter of George W. Bush, even joining the National Republican Women's Association. That's all changed now. Now I completely distrust President Bush, and I was one of I, my kids. Mommy. I can tell you, I was 
firm, firm supporter, strong Mommy, supporter. How many people Bush. died in Iraq? He was like a, a hero. Six hundred something, right? Mom, you know yeah. when that time, like, every time I said George Bush, he's screaming in Texas, he's screaming. I was like, yay, George Bush, yay. <laughs> he was having a speech. Back in January, Pam was also a supporter of plans to invade Iraq. You know, I was buying into it. Before the war, most Americans, the majority of Americans, were buying into it. We were concerned about weapons of mass destruction. We were, con we, we were concerned about, you know, uh, Saddam supporting terrorism. We, we had the Al-Qaeda connection and all that. We were, you know, we, everyone, people were buying into so it. So you thought it was a good idea to go to war? Right, because, you know, may, it's better, you know, do something before, you know, we get, you know, attacked. That was what we were led to believe, that if we didn't do something immediately, we were going to be, you know, wiped out. Pam no longer believes in the reasons given by the administration for going to war. She now suspects it was all about oil. This has led her to change her view about her husband's involvement in the war. When he joined the army, you know, he and I both believed he would never be sent into combat unless it was for the purpose of defending our country. And, let, and uh, would that's you... not, I don't see that now. <laughs> Pam now thinks the US should hand authority over to the United Nations. She says her views are shared by many other spouses at Fort Bragg. I think it's very widespread, but I think that the wives are afraid or they feel intimidated about saying anything, and I did too. But she says there is a need to speak out. And our troops need our support. Our troops need us maybe also to support them in a way that other Americans think is unpatriotic, but they need us to support us, say, bring our troops home now. Let's bring our troops home. Let's get our guys out of there. I think that's supporting them a lot more because we're saying, you know, we don't want our name, not one more soldier killed, not one more U.S. soldier killed, you know, for something that we don't believe is right. More and more military people are now speaking out. Last month, a national Bring Them Home Now campaign was launched in Fayetteville, Fort Bragg. My name is Erin Bird, and I'm an Army brat. And uh, my father is uh, retired in the Army. After 20 years, my sister's a first lieutenant in the Army in Germany right now. She's just gotten orders to go to Kuwait, and then I have uncles in the Air Force and uncles in the military. So, like, so many people, I have a lot of uh, military in my family, and I love the military, and I thank the military for everything that it's done for me. And as we send our soldiers off to risk their lives, more of them, I want to ask America to reflect on the last two years of deceit and um, half-truths. It seems that the coalition of the willing was more willing to lie to the American people and the people of the world. Nearly everyone in this room is connected to the military in some way. The campaign is inspired in part by President Bush's Bring Em On challenge when asked about attacks on US forces in Iraq. There are some who uh, feel like that, you know, the conditions are such that they can attack us there. My answer is bring them on. Today, we want to talk about the three words of false bravado uttered by President Bush from a safe and secure location, surrounded by armed guards, that taunted those shooting at our loved ones. Those three words galvanized military families speak out, Veterans for Peace, and other veterans organizations to initiate the campaign we are launching today. George Bush said, bring them on. We say, bring them home now. Unlike the wives of Fort Stewart, they don't just want their troops home, they want all troops home. This is a decidedly anti-war movement. It's very difficult for me to speak these three words. My only child, without losing it, anyway, I'm going to say it. My only child, Justin, was deployed on a Fort Bragg on March 29th, 2003. And he's now stationed in northern Iraq and Samara in the heart of the Sunni Triangle. He and the rest of his National Guard unit received a direct um, mortar attack. His office received a direct mortar attack a couple of weeks ago. He and the rest of his National Guard unit under, are under constant um, daily ambushes, under constant danger. Two months ago, the president said, essentially, the war is over. But the ground truth, as the, our troops who are there in Iraq now say, is a, a constant guerrilla war, daily chaos, a lack of planning, lack of basic supplies and equipment, lack of personnel. 
living conditions that grind our troops to exhaustion. How many of Bush, Bush's cabinet members have loved ones in the military in Iraq? Fernando Suarez de Sola has traveled all the way from California to be here. He's also here to speak about his son. I lost my son in this illegal war. My grandson lost the father in this bush war. And I ask you, Mr. President, how many kids you need for over this illegal war? And I ask the American people, how many kids you need for your gasoline in your car? How many kids you need for finish this terrific situation? I lost my son. But there's a lot of sun in Iraq right now. And I want, and my wife want, the everybody come back, come back home right now. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Organizers say they have 1,000 signed up members around the country, with thousands more interested. Veteran Stan Goff is one of the driving forces behind the campaign. He says that once it became public, they were flooded with support. Like 2,000 email, emails in 24 hours, overwhelmingly, uh, I would say 70, 80 percent uh, of these emails are very, very supportive. And a lot of them are from people in military families who really want to be connected to some sort of an organization because they have some real concerns. Oh, our local band. Oh, no, we got to get the local in there. Stan Goff is retired from a long career in the military. He served in eight conflict areas, including Vietnam, Grenada, Guatemala, Somalia, Haiti and Colombia. He's worked extensively in special operations and even taught at the prestigious military academy West Point. He thinks the operation in Iraq is unravelling. We've got 150,000 roughly between us and the Brits and a handful of other people, 150,000 troops that are supposed to be in there in a geographic area the size of California with 23 million people who don't want to be occupied and they think they can, and they think they can get, uh, uh, successfully conduct an occupation. That's absurd. Yeah, so you got, you know, the front page, you got a statement of purpose. And the Bring Them Home Now campaign is operating a busy website. They've been watching closely what happened to the Wives campaign at Fort Stewart and are using that as a cautionary tale. It sounds to me like it's effectively dampened their public dissent. One of the things that we're doing through the Bring Them Home campaign and the website is people can send us their grievances, send us their concerns, send us their complaints, and we don't have to put their name on there, but we're going to make sure that that message gets heard. Okay, check it out. Look. Again, what we're going to talk about here is we're going to talk about some uh, Iraqi and Arab culture things. Ross can give you a real brief picture of us on Iraq. Now. In under a week, Sergeant White from the 82nd Airborne Division will lead his men to Iraq. Today they're getting a crash course in everything from who Muhammad was. Now everybody knows who Muhammad is, right? He's got founded Islam. Okay. To the attitude of the Shiite majority in Iraq. But don't think that just because there's no trouble in the Shiite neighborhoods that they're going to pat you on the back and give you a Coke and say, hey, good job, America, all right? They don't like you any more than anybody else does because you're a non-believer, you're an infidel, okay? And that's just the way that it is. You need to get that in your mind. It doesn't matter if you're black, you're white, Hispanic, Thai, whatever. So they don't like you because you're not a Muslim. And even if you were a Muslim, they wouldn't like you because you're American. So you're screwed no matter what, okay? <laughs> That, For the right? troops on the okay. front line of so this war, there's no longer any talk of the U.S. being joyfully greeted as liberators. Everyone acknowledges the stark reality of what this has become, an unwelcome occupation. But you need to keep in mind these people's mindset. They're paranoid, okay? They don't trust the West. All right, they are, well, they may not be the most devout, some of them may not be the most devout Muslims in the world, they're still Muslims, and Muslims have a general aversion to non-Muslims being in their countries, okay, because they have a long memory, it goes all the way back to the Crusades, okay. The only reason they could think of for us to be there 
but we must want to get rid of fucking Islam. We must want all their oil. That's what they're thinking. Okay, that's not true. That's not what we're there for, but that's their mindset. Here at Fort Bragg, there's little sympathy for the military families back, who want the troops forward. brought home. Step back, step In these dangerous times, they argue, solidarity is needed. These people are, they're aiding the terrorists. They, they read that and it just reinforces the perception that Americans cut and run at casualties and when things get tough, we take off. All they're doing is just, they're propagating more attacks on soldiers by doing that. Because these people are thinking, hmm, if I kill one more soldier, and it all adds up, sooner or later the Americans are going to leave, and we're not going to leave Iraq. It's clear, though, that even the military's top brass is reading the warning signs coming from disgruntled family members. Major General Charles Schwanick is in charge of the 82nd Airborne Division, some of whom were sent first to Afghanistan and now Iraq. But the tough part is when you go back to the well time after again to go ahead and deploy our troopers, it's the family members, the kids and the spouses that go ahead and take a huge burden on back here. And that's where it starts getting a little bit tough. And that's where I have a concern, that they'll go back to the well too much with deployment after deployment after deployment after deployment. And that'll be manifested in the fact that I don't think we'll get the quality of people re-enlisting to stay in the Army because of that, because of the workload that we have. Hands, two, right, eight, all right, march. I'm right, march. That workload is not diminishing. Unless the situation in Iraq changes, fresh American troops will be needed for months, if not years. Bring Them Home Now campaigner Stan Goff is now facing this on a more personal level. To Stan's horror, his son recently joined the military and has just been deployed to Iraq. What did you think when he was called up for Iraq? Oh, well, you know, we were beside ourselves. I, I, I have to accommodate that I believe the Iraqis have every right to resist an occupation of their own country. And at the same time, I have to hope that my, that, that, that my son gets back okay. You know, that's a, that's, a, that's a tough thing to sort of hold on to both those beliefs at the same time, you know. But if a foreign power came in and invaded us here, we would fight them. What happens with this movement of spouses and family members will no doubt depend on the course of the war. While towns like Fort Bragg and Fort Stewart are incredibly patriotic, every death of a US soldier is felt more acutely here than anywhere else. I, I, I believe that it, it, it will get bigger as, if this situation continues as it is, because um, every day another soldier, you know, one, another soldier killed, another two soldiers killed, and um, and it, they, they, they know how the situation, how it is for their spouses over there, their sons, their brothers, whoever. It's, there's going to be a lot more family members speaking up, more spouses too. I believe so.